All right, hi everyone, uh, welcome. I am Natalie Belanger of the Adult Historical Society. And despite the strange lighting that's happening to me right now, I am alive, I am not a ghost, even though I think I appear gray to all of you, or at least to those of you who's, they, I look gray on my own screen, it's really disconcerting. But forget about that because this is not about me. This is about uh, the three wonderful people that I have here with me today from Trinity College who are going to talk to you about hidden literacies and exciting new project. Uh, coordinated at Trinity. And I'm going to start by um, handing it over to Hillary Wiss, and she is going to tell you about herself and get the ball rolling tonight. Great. Well, thank you, Natalie. And we're really excited about um, presenting this. This is actually our first presentation on this website. So in some ways, you all are our guinea pigs, and you can uh, tell us what you think about the well, I guess the presentation, but more, more properly about the, the website itself. So my name is Hillary Wiss and I'm the Smith Professor of English at Trinity College. I'm also the author of um, two books, Writing Indians and English Letters and Indian Literacies. I teach and research in early American literature and Native American writing. And I'm Chris Hager. Um, I'll just uh, get that out of the way now. I'm uh, also a member of the English department with Hillary, uh, and uh, I teach primarily 19th century American literature um, and uh, have written a lot about um, the writings of um, enslaved people in the South during the antebellum period and Civil War soldiers and their families. And hi, everyone. Uh, last but not least, I'm Mary, and I'm the digital scholarship strategist at Trinity College. I'm also a historian and a podcaster, and I was so delighted to get to work with Chris and Hillary on this project. And Hillary, as you tell us maybe a little bit about it, I'm going to share my screen now and um, show you some images from it. And I did put a link to our slides into the chat so you can follow along with us. So I'm just waiting for, yeah. Okay. So this is um, our, our website, uh, we, which we actually started working on back in April, 2019, which now feels like eons ago because uh, it was before COVID. So we, we started with a conference at Trinity um, where we had about a dozen scholars come in to, um, to talk with us about uh, the, the topic of hidden literacies. Uh, and so th I'm just going to read you the, the, the sort of the tagline of the conference, right? H hidden literacies brings together leading scholars of historical literacy from across the country to investigate the surprising, often neglected roles reading and writing have played in the lives of marginalized Americans from indigenous and enslaved people to prisoners and young children. So just a variety of, of literacies, right? Ways of thinking about reading and writing. Um, and from that conference, we created the website. Um, so there are, there are three components to the website. One, the first is that there is a, a, an original text um, that is, and with that text, you can see the handwriting, the material form, any particular limitations or things of interest about the actual words on the page. And then attached to that original text is an essay by a scholar. So the, the, the people who were at the conference wrote up their 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 uh, conference presentations. Um, so because they had selected their original object, they had a lot to say about the background and what makes that object interesting um, and and basically sort of helped to lay out for the rest of us uh, what was interesting, complicated, engaging about the particular object they had chosen. Um, and the final piece, so the, the, the three pieces, the original text, the essay by the scholar, and the, the final piece uh, was the podcast where um, Mary had conversations with each of the scholars to bring out elements of what it was that, that had interested them. And Mary, I'm gonna 
ask you to just to talk briefly about that the podcast component. Absolutely. Um, so I'll share a link to the project itself now into the chat. Uh, so I was really fortunate in getting to attend the conference that brought the contributors together. And that's where I began interviews with uh, some of them about their process. And so each part of this project um, brings something different to our imagined um, user and audience. And I think for me, what the podcast offered was something that is very special to digital scholarship generally. So if you make something with digital tools or software, there's as much you can learn from the process of making it as you can by the end product itself. Um, that's something that we talk about when we offer digital um, education about digital tools at Trinity to faculty and students and staff. And so in this case, I think a podcast where I got to interview the contributors, I really asked them about their process. How did they find something that was hidden in the archives? How did they situate it and provide it with context? And how do they assign it meaning and interpretation? And what can we make of it? What should we do with it? And that's what each episode of the podcast um, attempts to kind of depict, which contributes to these really rich um, central elements of the project of the original source material and their interpretation of it. So it sort of fills in some interpretive gaps there. So that's, that's what the podcast is intending to do. So if you listen to each episode, um, you'll hear each contributor talk about their process and their preparation for meeting this moment, moment of finding something hidden in the archives and wanting to read it. And Chris and Hillary have an episode where they talk about their own experience with archives um, and literacy as well. And we've also interviewed two um, archivists about sort of how things get hidden in the first place. So that was sort of the intended role of the podcast. Great. Yeah, thank you for that. And I, and let me just say that uh, Mary sort of transformed the project by by producing this podcast and having this this element to that that took the whole thing sort of to to a whole different level. Um, so I wanted to talk now a little bit about. Uh, just sort of some general thoughts about literacy and archives before we dive into some of the specific examples from the, the site itself. Um, so when we say literacy, what we're, what we're really talking about it just in, in the most basic way is the ability to read and write, right? And it's, it seems like a pretty straightforward thing, but it, it's actually incredibly complicated. Um, historically, it's a process that has all kinds of different meanings, right? So, so for one thing, reading is different and or separate from writing in the sort of early colonial 19th century moment. And this is a horn book that's actually in the Connecticut Historical Society's collection. A horn book is a, um, it's an artifact, it, it's how children learn how to read. So um, you, I think you, you might be able to see it has an alphabet, it has sort of the basic building blocks of literacy. And what I love about this image is you see the, the archivist with the, the gloves, it's a tiny thing, right? It's a tiny thing that's intended to fit in the pocket of a child, right? Who's, who's gonna sort of be, be figuring out these sort of basic, uh, elements of reading practice just sort of more or less independently, right? Um, okay, so if reading and writing are different, then we have here a, a selection of pens and that tells, that shows you right away like how phenomenally different. Uh, th these pens also, by the way, are from the Connecticut Historical Society's collection. Um, the, the implements of literacy shift dramatically over time, right? And, and one of the things that's so fascinating about that is we don't always track very carefully when those shifts happen because literacy is such a mundane thing. It's such an ordinary thing. And we all assume that everybody knows how things work that we actually lose, like when you shift from a quill to a nib pen, right? Like things, get lost, things that, that are just part of a regular practice of, of literacy, like people don't remember them anymore, right? As we move from, you know, in a lot of ways from paper to, to computer literacy, right? Students 
as, as any educator knows, right? Like all the conversations around cursive, right? Do, do students need cursive, right? How do, how do those kinds of practices happen, right? Um, so when, when we get into practices of historical literacy, we're really entering these, these worlds that are complicated in all kinds of ways, right? And people at various moments have had very different levels of access to literacy and, and very different uses for it. So um, in, it, and this is a portrait again from the Connecticut Historical Society's collection that shows two children with a book in hand. And it's kind of a complicated picture, right? In a lot of ways, because are these, are, uh, these are two children. So we could see this as a, a boy and his little sister, but it's also possible that those clothes are just of a, of a younger child where the, the clothes that a boy and a girl wouldn't be differentiated. So are, are they two boys? Are they a boy and a girl? And, and, and they have a book in front of them and they're sort of, they're well-dressed sort of elite white readers, right? That are, that are represented here. And in, and in a lot of ways, they're right on track for to become the kind of readers that are sort of socially and culturally assumed to to dominate, right? Um, but but in fact, literacy means really different things for different people. Um, and if alphabetic literacy, that is the kind of literacy that produces that book that these children are reading, um, is sort of the main form of literacy in colonial places, there are all kinds of other literacies circulating at the same moment, right? So we have indigenous cultural practices where they, there will be a whole other set of assumptions around communicative practices that wouldn't really be captured through a book or a pen and ink, right? Um, there are other material forms of communication among people who have limited access to alphabetic li literacy. So for example, women who, are, who would be um, using sewing and sewing practices as a, as a way to e exchange ideas or express themselves, right? Communication practices among the enslaved where uh, literacy isn't necessarily uh, encouraged or um, and it might be something that people wouldn't necessarily be uh, advertising about themselves that they that they have uh, literacy, the ability to to read and write. Um, Chris, do you want to add anything at this point? You know, I'll just maybe say that uh, one of the ways that we can think about um, approaching literacy in this way is that. Um, Normally people like Hillary and me who have PhDs in English and teach in English departments, we study and we teach about things that have been published. Um, and so there's a very clear sort of flow of, um, of the written word from producers who get their work put into print to consumers who read it. Um, and one of the things that, that this project does is it, it looks into what hasn't been published, what was never published, what's been sitting in archives. And part of what you see there is that actually it's not such a straightforward flow of the written word from you know, uh, an urban publishing center to readers out in the hinterland, but there is production of writing going on in many different ways by many different people. And not all of them had access to publishing. Um, and so as we go through what we're gonna talk about, what you'll see, I think are things that don't necessarily look like literature. They look like historical artifacts. Um, but part of what this project does is to ask us to think about how is literacy a place where people's historical lives are documented in ways that never maybe make it into a printed page on a shelf in a library, the way that we're accustomed to thinking about. Um, the historical record or the written word. And, and I'll just add here that, um, at, so Chris and I are both in English department, so we're, we're scholars of, of literature, but the two poets who are included in this collection, and they're, they're very, very famous, very important poets, Phyllis Wheatley and Walt Whitman, we actually didn't include their poetry, right? We didn't, we, we have um, texts that sort of complicate who they are and how they are represented and 
who's engaging with them and right so we're very consciously trying to disrupt what what is literature and how do we think about how how it's related to the practices of reading and writing right so one of the ways of course is through archives right um, and archives are quite simply places where historical and cultural materials are stored um, the Connecticut Historical Society is uh, an excellent example and one of the best in the country and I should say here that I'm especially biased about the Connecticut Historical Society because it would not have been possible to, for me to write either of my books without its collection. But I suspect I'm not the only person in this Zoom room who's biased uh, in favor of the Connecticut Historical Society. So I probably don't have to sing its praises overly to convince you that it's a, an absolutely extraordinary archive. Um, but even as an extraordinary archive, or perhaps because it is such an exceptional archive with such a deep history of collecting, um, archives are always limited by the decisions of the people who run them, what to collect, how to preserve it, what to preserve about it, right? And generational shifts in what matters and how it matters means that that archives like the Connecticut Historical Society might have things that we can no longer find because of the kinds of search terms that we are looking for now were simply not of interest to the people who originally collected them, right? So these are massive collections and there are just things in those collections that, that don't necessarily get marked for the in interests and investments of future generations. So then they become very difficult to find, right? Um, so Hidden Literacies, our, our website, is its own kind of archive, right? It's different because we don't actually have the materials themselves. But what we do have is the interpretive element that makes visible what it is that we value and why it is that we are, we are compiling these things together, right? Um, and so we are, because we're invested in this sort of this idea of, of the hiddenness of the kinds of literacies that are represented here, um, the, the, the scholars and the, the essays that are included with the materials um, really kind of help us to see some of the ways in which those, um, those things get hidden, right? Or what it is that's hidden, right? What we, what we maybe assumed that like didn't allow us to see a, a whole element of what was, what was happening there. Um, so uh, as you can see from the, the, the site, um, you, there's a drop down menu on the left hand side and you can go to the different, different, um, uh, people, right? So, so the scholar and the the item itself, and the and the podcast, right? So, I'm going to start by taking us to the Phyllis Wheatley um, example, uh, which is actually again from the Connecticut Historical Society's collection. Uh, so, the 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 letter in question is a letter. Um, written by Susanna Wheatley to Samson Occam. Um, but it's the, the, the Katie Childs, the, the, the scholar who is writing about this letter has pointed out that actually it's while Susanna Wheatley, who is the, um, the enslaver of Phyllis Wheatley, who is the, a, a, a famous poet, um, Phyllis Wheatley actually wrote the letter itself, right? Because Susanna Wheatley, Wheatley was ill at the time and was lying in bed. And so um, Susanna Wheatley, or sorry, Phyllis Wheatley wrote the actual document in question, right? Um, so uh, what our site does in this moment is it looks at this, this famous poet, Phyllis Wheatley, and it talks about the ways in which how we think about her writing 
and her um, textual production um, is really complicated when we look at this letter, right? So she's, she's a writer of poetry and the letter, this letter by Susanna Re Wheatley, who that is written, like that is physically written by Phyllis Wheatley, who is enslaved by Susanna Wheatley, is actually about the book that Phyllis Wheatley is publishing in London at this moment, right? So it's like the all of these circuits of knowledge are happening in this letter, right? And so the scholar points out that, well, whenever um, people formerly, not so much anymore, used to talk about Phyllis Wheatley as a, an African-American, um, an, an enslaved person who was brought from Africa to America and that horrific middle passage as a small child was um, owned, right? Was, was purchased uh, at, and um, brought into the family of uh, John and Susanna Wheatley right? When, when she wrote her collection of poetry, people were always charging, were saying that's not possible. There must be white people who helped her, right? And so what Katie Childs points out in her essay is, well, maybe we have that backwards, right? Like maybe what we need to understand is how mediated writing is always, right? No one is accusing Phyllis Wheatley of writing Susanna Wheatley's letter to Samson Ockham in this case, right? But she certainly did. She wrote those words, right? So how do we think about writing? How do we think about reading, right? And how do we understand the relationship between these things, right? So that is one of the examples that we have on this website. Um, and Chris, I'm going to invite you to to take the next one. Yeah, I'll talk about another one. Um, so I've got a few slides here to talk about uh, another of the um, artifacts that's included in the Hidden Literacies website. Um, and, you know, as you were looking at that portrait of the, the two children with the book, um, you know, one of the things you might have been thinking is, oh, well, what were they reading? Well, they were probably reading children's literature. Um, this is a good way to think about um, how some forms of literacy can become hidden. If I were to ask you, what is women's literature or what is Native American literature? You'd say, well, it's, it's literature written by women or literature written by Native American people. Children's literature, however, is different. Children's literature is literature written by non-children intended to be what children want. Um, so this is an example of, well, what actually do children produce when they exercise their literacy in productive ways rather than passive receptive ways. Um, so these two examples um, of children writing that you see on the screen here, um, obviously different levels of writer. Um, the one on the upper right is probably fairly young. The one at the lower left um, is writing in 1862 and is writing a letter to a Civil War soldier um, at the urging of her teacher, dear soldier, this afternoon our teacher told us she would like to have some of the scholars write a letter um, to Mr. Black's brother, uh, who was serving in the army. Where these two examples of children's writing come from is the Connecticut Historical Society collections. Specifically, on this next slide, um, they come from a scrapbook kept by Jane and Edna Cheney, who um, operated a school in Manchester. Their schoolhouse still exists, it has been moved. It's not in its original location, but it's still in Manchester, still standing. Um, and uh, they kept, what you see on the left here, they had a big ledger that had like a dictionary um, tabs on the right margin of the pages. So you could flip to the alphabetized sections of the book and they pasted work by the children in their school onto the different pages of this big thick ledger um, that is in the CHS collection. Um, if we look at a, a, on the next slide, we'll see uh, an even more sort of developed example of what, um, what a child might produce. Um, alphabet books were, as they are today, um, a very popular and ubiquitous form of children's literature, books that have some creative way to um, engage children in learning the alphabet. Um, this one, which is illustrated with these human figures creating the shapes of 
um, the letters and little verses beneath them, was actually created, um, as we see on the next slide, by a child, um, a lad between 11 and 12 years of age. Um, this is in the Connecticut Historical Society collections as well. So those are a few examples um, from the archive here to sort of contextualize the next item, which um, in the Hidden Literacies website, it is a magazine produced by children. Um, the scholar who brought this into the project and wrote the essay about it is named Karen Sanchez Epler, and she's a professor at Amherst College. Um, came to her knowledge because a, um, uh, someone she was acquainted with, with found a box at an auction that came out of the, um, the possession of a New Hampshire farm family from the 19th century. And the, the children in this family, the Nelson family, um, produced a whole run of magazines that they produced sort of to resemble what um, magazines in that era produced for children looked like, but with many of their own original spins on it. Um, and the essay that Sanchez Upler writes explores what we can sort of learn about them as both readers of, you know, quote unquote, real magazines, magazines from publishers, and as writers of an original magazine, what that shows us about their literacy um, and their position in that culture at that time. I think we got time for Mary Ockenhiller. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, so we so we're just going to present you with three examples from the website, and then we're going to open it up to questions. So, um, actually, Mary, if you go to the slide with uh, on Samson Ockham. Okay, so um, it's, I'm not sure who who in the in the room in the Zoom room knows who Samson Ockham is. So I'm just going to very briefly sort of lay out who he is. Right, he's a Mohican uh, missionary and educator. Uh, he uh, was um, the he worked with Eliezer Wheelock in uh, founding Moore's Charity School, which was in Lebanon, Connecticut. Uh, and he, Samson Ockham traveled to Great Britain for more than two years to raise money for this school, which was supposed to be for Native American students in New England. And while he was gone, Wheelock sort of changed his plans and the school ended up moving shortly after um, Occam returned, it moved up to New, New Hampshire and became Dartmouth College. Um, and this was a, a very sort of bitter experience for Samson Occam who felt deeply betrayed by this move. Um, and so he had, had a falling out with, with Wheelock. Um, he, he goes on after this to write a, a very famous sermon that was widely published and he becomes sort of a, 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 a an important author in his own right, like se separate from the whole Morse Charity School experience. Okay, so that's who Samson Occam is. And I, I'll just remind you that the first slide that we looked at, the Phyllis Wheatley, who, and again, Phyllis Wheatley is this famous, famous um, early African-American poet, the, the, the first poet to have, have published in, in, uh, in colonial America. Uh, the letter that she wrote was to Samson Occam, right? So there's this kind of intersection here of all of these, these different um, things, right? The, the Wheatley family, um, were supporters of Samson Occam. Samson Occam sold Phyllis Wheatley's book um, when he was um, going out as a missionary and traveling around. So th there are lots of intersections here, right? Okay, so that sort of situates Samson Occam. The, 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 um, the thing that we have on the website is actually not Samson Occam, it is the household inventory of Mary Ockham, who is his wife. And what's interesting about this inventory is that it is, um, so the, the one that we have on the 
on the on the website is actually from Dartmouth College's collection. Uh, and it is from uh, 1765 to 67, which means that Samson Ockham was actually in Great Britain when this thing was written. So even though the title of the, the, the list, uh, the account list is expenses for Samson Ockham, it's actually not Samson Ockham because we know he was away. We know, in fact, it was his wife, Mary Ockham, who had who, who was buying these supplies, right? And so the scholar who wrote the accompanying essay, uh, whose name is Kelly Weiskup, um, talks about, well, how do we read an account like this, right? It's not written by Mary Ockham. It's written by just whoever the grocer was that was selling her these supplies. Like, how do we make meaning out of these kinds of documents? And how do we understand something that, that how do we understand the role of indigenous women when they're constantly being erased by the, the white grocer who's, who's maintaining these accounts, right? He won't even acknowledge that he's only actually interacting with Mary Ockham because Samson Ockham is physically not even present for all of this, right? So the account that Kelly Weiskup looked at is, uh, as I said, in the, the Dartmouth College collections, right, which is its own kind of special kind of irony when we know how fraught that relationship was, right? The Connecticut Historical Society actually has a different household inventory of Mary Ock. And there's such an interesting overlap with these because it's from 1808, right? So what that means is this is another one where Samson Ockham is not present because he is at this point, he would have died sometime earlier, right? He would have died probably roughly 15 years ago. Um, and, and so what we can learn from this listing is that Mary Ockham is still living where she lived with Samson Ockham she didn't return to her home community, which was on Long Island. She stayed in, um, in Mohegan, right? Um, and we get to see what her expenses are. And one of the things that for me is so um, interesting and, and sort of poignant about this is it's that the title on it is, um, it's, it's the, the accounts of Molly Ockham. And so it makes you think, wait, was she not Mary Ockham? Did everybody just know that her name was Molly and everybody called her Molly? Or was that a, what does that mean that it's Molly Ockham when it's very clearly this person, right? Like everything about the account, we know it is the wife of, or at this point, the widow of Samson Ockham, right? So it's this kind of tantalizing moment where you can read these things in these accounts that aren't, that were never meant to be what was important about this list, right? What was supposed to be important about it was the money, right? Did she pay? Did, you know, how much was each thing worth? Did she pay? And, and are the accounts balanced? But what we can actually get from this is a whole range of other things. Um, and I'll just flag very quickly that this is connected to two other um, moments on the website. One is uh, the scholar Tara Bynum read a different accounting that is of an enslaved man writing in Rhode Island, right? And what she sees in his account book. So he's an enslaved man in Rhode Island who maintained his own financial records just for himself, right? And what she finds in this little tiny fragment of text is a celebration. It's a party, right? It's a barbecue. They had, they have, they roast a pig. And so she talks about the ways in which we can kind of recover these moments of lived experience, right? It's, and it's similar in that way. How do you take a list that's just really there for the money piece? And how do you untangle a whole story, right? A whole different version of what, what that list is telling us, right? And the, 
The other piece that it's connected to is a piece by the scholar Caroline Wigginton, which is about a, a different indigenous woman in Georgia who is, um, a, a, it's a whole sort of set of contested land deeds. Uh, and so this, this experience of how do indigenous women make their presence known in a sort of colonial world that has no interest in them as political beings because they're, they're, they're focused on the men who are supposed to be the political figures in their minds, right? So it's this very interesting process of how do we recover this indigenous women's experience in these, these sets of documents. Okay, so I think what we'd like to do now is, is open it up and invite your questions and follow up and... One thing that I'll just add, you know, by way of sort of concluding is, um, you know, one of our motivations in trying to take some of this material that um, normally one would only encounter in a sort of specialized trip to an archive, looking very carefully for something on a perhaps arcane topic that required some expertise, that we could make these things much more accessible to people who, um, without traveling to an archive and without necessarily knowing much about what they were looking at at first, could encounter some of these more hidden examples of how people read and write um, and have that, that, got, that expert guide there um, writing some commentary along with them. Um, so, you can be very helpful to us if you're willing um, in sort of, you know, reflecting a little bit on what seems accessible or inaccessible about some of this material, what you want to know more about. And I did put in the chat that you can feel free to type your questions there or just unmute and fire away. I have an unrelated question that I might just throw out there while people are thinking about what they might want to discuss. And I'm I'm really kind of calling back, I don't know if you remember this, Chris and Hillary, to our conversations that led to, that are in the um, your episode of the podcast. But I think what's kind of helpful sometimes is to hear like an anecdote of your own experience of how you stumbled on something hidden in plain sight, because I think that's really the beauty of this project is kind of learning how to read the same text in new ways. So I know like Hillary, you shared about finding, I think a description of Samson Occam's home in another document. Maybe you, you wanna share that to give people a sense of kind of like what it's like to stumble on something like this in an archive. Yeah, well, so um, it was quite a while ago now and I was at a different archive and I was working on Samson Occam and a, a variety of different things and um, there were a number of scholars who were all working on, on different materials. And one of them was reading, he was actually writing a book about um, bachelors in, in early America. And so he was reading diaries of uh, unmarried men in this period. And we, we, would, we would all be talking to each other all the time and he and he walked up to me at one point and he was like what what was the name of that guy that you were writing about right and so we figured out Samson Occam he's like yeah yeah there's a description in one of these diaries of a guy who goes to visit his house and it was it was kind of this incredible moment this sort of serendipitous like how is that possible it wasn't marked at all in any of the archival materials because nobody was thinking about Samson Occam when this thing had been collected years ago, right? And there was this detailed description of what his house looked like and when this guy visited and what he saw and he was really impressed by how many books Samson Occam owned and, you know, and, and so he talks about it and then he moves on and he sort of keeps going. It's a, it's a diary. It was this fascinating moment and this moment where you realize how provisional knowledge is, right? Like how temporary and how many things have to align for some of this knowledge to emerge, 
we have a question in the chat. I was going to um, speak to Sierra's question. Um, it's hard for me to narrow down a favorite item um, or thing that we learned in doing this. I mean, I will say that as someone who um, frequently teaches uh, 19th century American literature, including Walt Whitman's poetry, um, I was sort of blown away by the artifact that a scholar named Matt Cohen brought forward. You might've seen the headline flash by on the screen. There was a, a page titled Walt Whitman's Baby Talk. And then what that is, is a letter, it's, a, it's fan mail written to Walt Whitman by uh, a white Southern man who had been a soldier in the Confederate army, um, who was so enamored of Walt Whitman that he named one of his children after Walt Whitman. And then in his, fan letter of the month to Walt Whitman, um, he slipped out of his own voice and began writing a letter in the voice of the infant child named after Walt Whitman in a phonetic rendering of baby talk. It's really weird. Um, and it, it's, a, it's the kind of thing that um, I think you can have an instinct that there's something you know, very unique here, but it is a really slow process to figure out what it means and sort of working with Matt Cohen, that scholar about how he wanted to present what he thought it meant um, was really rewarding. Um, you know, and and to sort of to to Kathy's question, I mean, when we have more things to say, Mary and Hillary about um, Sierra's question, but to Kathy's question about is it ongoing? Um, potentially, yes. I mean, we, you know, we had to sort of regroup in the wake of COVID to figure out how we wanted to bring this all forward. Um, but part of what attracted us to the idea of doing a digital project rather than a published book is precisely the fact that um, it didn't have to be over as soon as it was published. It could, it could continue to change and to grow. Um, and, you know, some of the contributors to this project remain in, you know, they, they've followed back up with us. So like, oh, I found out a new thing. Um, so uh, it's ongoing, in, I think, in several senses. Oh, I'm trying to I'm trying to keep up with these these comments that I I'm such such a slow reader. Which... <laughs> How about we'll take them one by one? I'll share them in case somebody can't access the chat. So Elizabeth shared, hi, do you see tags metadata helping as we digitize collection catalogs as a means of including more helpful search vocabulary? I am working on some student journals from 1859 from the Staples Academy in Easton. Very excited about this forum. I, so oh. I think that's such a great question because it's not like archivists haven't been tagging things all along. It's just that the things we want to see tagged shift sort of over time, you know? So, I mean, Mary, maybe you have more to say about like. Yeah, well, I was something that's really interesting. Somebody actually referenced a great book um, in the chat during the presentation by Aaliyah Henley, who strangely was in my, I went to graduate school with her. So I am hyping this book, not only because I think very highly of her, but also because it's a great book and there's a chapter on CHS and its collections. And she makes this great point that originally CHS was collecting things in the attics and the family artifacts of people for whom this mattered. Um, so you can imagine it was elite, mostly white people. And now in cataloging followed suit. I mean, most of the cataloging terms were, were defined by people determining what mattered. There is a practice now of going back in and actually recataloging objects in entire archives. And actually at, at Trinity College, the Watkinson Library has done a lot of work to that effect that I think Hillary and Chris can speak to as well, of going in and re and contributing new metadata and new tags to records that have existed for quite a long time, but reinscribing new meaning into those same objects. Yeah, so I mean, I guess what that basically means is it's it's never over. I mean, and it's not news to any archivist in the in in this room, you know. But it's not like oh, we have fully, you know, documented this thing, and now we move on to the next one, right? Like it's always going to be cyclical. It's always going to be sort of complicated in different ways. And there's been um, really great projects about um, suggesting terms to use and helpful terms that can be really helpful in a broader sense of helping draw researchers that are interested in these topics to your collections who might not otherwise know they're there. Um, so I'm happy to follow up with Natalie with some links to those collections that I don't have on hand right now. But um, if you look around, there are um, really great librarians doing research on these topics and, and kind of moving the needle forward. So it's an ongoing process, as Hillary said, but I think that that is a, a really central thing that collections are doing and archives are doing to 
kind of um, make uh, visible things that were hidden. Um, so that's that's definitely an important practice. Uh, to go to Jessica's question, I have a Boston Globe from 1913, and I've read the tattered pages multiple times. Would love to use them in their mysterious news stories, comics, obits, et cetera. I'd love to hear how you would utilize this resource in a writing class. Thanks. I love that question so much because I think if you did that, what you would find is how little you actually know about 1913 and, and how, like how much is just gone. You know what I mean? Like the, 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 exactly what you're saying, the mysterious news stories, comics, obits, like, yeah, the comics are impenetrable, right? Like you go back even 30 years and, you know, things that I once thought were hilarious. My kids are like, I don't get it. What, you know, like it. And, and so then you, you go back a hundred years and it's just completely like, what is funny about that? How does it work? And, and I, so I think that what would be amazing to do in a classroom is lean into what we don't know, you know, rather than try to get like, we can master this, we can get the, the answers here. You can lean into what, what, do, what do we think this means, right? Like, so pick any one thing, right? Like an obituary even, or, right? Cause an obituary from 1913 is gonna take you back a kind of a long way, right? Like, and so picking any one piece of writing and then just really challenging students to like, what are the things we don't know about this piece of writing? And then, what of this could we know and how? And then in fact, could we do that, <laughs> right? Like, so even just using it as an experiment in like just embracing how transitory things are. Chris, the other thing you can do with newspapers, well, the other thing you do with newspapers is like, like you can, um, you know, so college students and to some extent maybe high school students depending on what sorts of resources they have access to a lot of the times if you're um, looking at historical newspapers through like digital resources like ProQuest um, you can search and you get an article actually literally pulled out of context um, they'll give you a pdf of the article without showing you what else is on that page and you have to click a different button to see the whole page um, and so sometimes students want to sort of read into one article or one item. But I think it's great to sort of challenge them to look at the full page and to read across. Because even though there's not necessarily anything that these different items, obituaries, news articles, advertisements have in common except for one date in history, um, well, they, they are part of the same cultural moment because they're on that date. And so sometimes it can be really useful for students instead of sort of diving into the content of one article to think about, well, what else is in the same issue of the newspaper and how does that help me shed light on what's going on here? What patterns do I notice um, if I read several disparate articles about different things? So I love the, the comment about Fidelia Fielding um, and you, you are correct that um, her, her diary, the last diary is back at Mohegan now. Um, and yes, you're it, like yes to everything in this in in this comment, right? So the comment is wondering if language is sometimes an issue. I'm thinking of the poetry and writings of Fidelia Fielding, the last speaker of Mohegan. Sometimes she wrote diaries in Mohegan, hugely important, but could easily be overlooked. I'm not sure where these are. I think they're back in Mohegan, all right? Um, yeah, so, and, and especially when you're looking at indigenous uh, materials, uh, a lot of it is written in in languages that that um, no longer have fluent speakers or are sort of like being recovered in certain ways, and so that that becomes complicated in all kinds of ways because some of these languages, the the written form is um, is, is not, it doesn't go back a, a very long way, but the language itself, of course, goes back a really, really long way. So, so for example, in our, on our website, one of the 
pieces is um, in the Cherokee syllabary. And if, if you don't know much about the Cherokee syllabary, it's a, it's a print language. So, the, so Cherokee as a language goes back a very long time. The syllabary was invented in the 19th century by uh, one person, um, Sequoia, right? And it, it took off instantly. Right, and, it, and so for a long time, there were more Cherokee writers of the syllabary than English by a significant margin, right? Like by, by a ton. Um, and, and over time that sort of shifted, right? So the, the piece that we have on our website is actually a letter written in the syllabary in the 1950s, right? So not that long ago, right? Um, from somebody who is in the state prison back to his his family, right? And and it's it's actually one of my favorite pieces, even though it's outside of, like uh, my my own area of, of of study is the colonial period. But I find this thing absolutely fascinating, for precisely the language reasons, right? So he can say things that he couldn't say otherwise because the 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 prison people can't can't read the syllabary right so so he gets this letter out and it's just a, a family letter right like hope hope everybody's well and that kind of thing but it's still it's, there's a kind of an ownership of um, his, his own sense of of community and identity through his choice to write the letter in the syllabary And thanks, Lynn, for sharing the uh, the ancient burial ground project link. Yes, um, you know it's uh, uh, it's one of the challenges I think of this kind of work is how do you how do you um, you know discover the meaning in traces of people's lives that by other sets of standards seem really inadequate, right? If if you're accustomed to studying um, people whose you know, whose families saved voluminous letters and diaries, you have access to so much, so much material from which to sort of create a portrait, a biographical portrait of somebody. But what if all you have is that little page out of an account book or a headstone? Um, well, that, that seems like it's not enough to do anything, but it's not nothing either. Um, it just takes different, um, different methods. I love these questions. They're so they're so great. I'm I'm wondering how many people are uh, K through twelve teachers that are that are here. I mean, we, you know, it it is genuinely our hope that it will be useful in the classroom. Um, and so I, I, I hope that you, you get a chance to spend some time with it and, and hope, hopefully your students as well. And we made sure that everything that, all the handwritten documents that are reproduced on the site, they're all transcribed. So a person doesn't have to read cursive handwriting in 18th or 19th century um, script. Um, there's a full text transcription, but, um, our own experience, and we had we had fun experiences working with some of our undergraduate students who were research assistants on this project. Um, and like most young people these days, they were initially, um, you know, they didn't think it was possible for them to read this stuff. I don't know how to read cursive, um, but they learned. Um, they ended up actually writing a handbook for other students to learn how to do it um, because they were pleased to find that, in fact, you know, the youthful brain is very plastic, um, and they were able to. Um, to do it. So your students can too. And my not so youthful brain is not as plastic, I guess, but I am still trying to learn things. So if any teachers here end up using the project, I think we'd all love to hear from you just to get your feedback about how it went. And we're looking for any kind of suggestions to make the site easier to navigate or anything that would be useful. So that would be great. You can find our contact information, I think, on the site itself. Um, and if not, they're definitely on the Trinity website.
Well, thank you so much. This was fantastic. I um, started, I got a little lost reading that um, the baby talk letter to Walt Whitman and it's deeply disturbing and I'm going to have to go back and give yes, it, it is. a second and third and fourth look because I'm, I'm, I don't think I absorbed half of it. Um, so yes, um, actually, Mary, you had mentioned having some resources that you might share with me um, about um, about um, ar things, archives and so forth, like what archives can do to make all of this um, easier for researchers and teachers. And um, if, I'm happy to, I can send that out to everybody who was um, on the Zoom call or registered for the talk. Um, also, uh, this we did record this, we have recorded this. So if you know anyone who uh, wanted to be able to wasn't able to be here, but was interested, it will be up on our CHS YouTube page in about a week, and you'll be able to um, watch it and share it with, with your friends. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, Hillary, Christopher, Mary, this was just really fantastic, and what a, what a great project. Just really awesome. Thank you. I think uh, everyone in the uh, room is giving you a little uh, unseen round of applause at home. Oh, well, thank you. And thank you thank for you, indulging Natalie. us because we just think we're so excited about this project. So it's, it's, it, we appreciate your willingness to engage with us. Yeah. And uh, Lynn Williamson just put in the chat that um, she is involved at CHS in a metadata um, project for um, uh, the focus on community cultural practices. And she has, she would like to talk to you folks at some point about um, the various practices that they're doing in question. So um, Lynn, I can get you in touch. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. Um, have a great evening. Thank you, Natalie. Yep, Thanks, thank Natalie. You so much. Good night.